Hi, uh, in this part, uh, I'm going to talk about pathology of disorders of the stomach. This part is chronic gastritis. Uh, again, my name is Mariam Peju, and uh, feel free to email me. So this is outline of our talk on stomach disorders. First, we went over normal histology of the stomach, uh, moving to acute gastritis and gastropathy. And in this part, we are going to cover chronic gastritis. So what can cause chronic gastritis? Uh, the first or the most common cause of chronic gastritis is a helicobacter pylori infection. Long-standing helicopyloric uh, infection can lead to atrophic gastritis, often it's multifocal. Another cause of chronic gastritis is autoimmune gastritis. This is the most common form of chronic gastritis in patients without H. pylori infection and also the most common cause of diffuse, diffuse atrophic gastritis. There are less common causes also, a radiation injury, chronic bile reflux, mechanical injury like nasogastric tube, also involvement by subsystemic diseases like Crohn's disease, amyloidosis, and graft versus host disease. What are the symptoms that the patients present with chronic gastritis? Is it less severe than acute gastritis? Sometimes, but it's often more persistent. Patients often present with nausea, pain, sometimes vomiting. What is the histology of chronic gastritis? We said gastritis is inflammation of gastric mucosa, gastric lining. Chronic inflammation is plasma cells and lymphocytes. So here you can see normal gastric mucosa, as we can say it's gastric foveal or epithelium, fundic type gland or antral type gland. Here you have fundic mucosa. There is not much inflammation as you can see in between the glands. Here is when chronic gastritis happen. You have a lot of these uh, blue lymphocytes in plasma cells um, expanding, going in between uh, the gastric epithelium in the mucosa. So this is chronic inflammation, basically lymphocytes and plasma cells. You also can have some lymphoid aggregate. Let's go over helicobacter pylori gastritis. We, we said it's a most common type of chronic gastritis. Helicobacter pylori is a bacteria that can be trans, um, there is a fecal oral transmission or contamination. It's, a, uh, it's more common in the lower socioeconomic status. This helicobacter pylori is often, it's a bacteria that's spiral shaped or curved bacilli. It has flagella, it allows it to be motile. It has urease, it, gener it generates ammonia from urea. It can increase the pH and enhance the bacterial survival. Adhesins is bacterial uh, adherence to surface foveolar cells. So adhesins of the bacteria will cause it to adhere. And also have some toxins, cytotoxin associated gene A that can be involved in disease progression. So basically these bacteria attach to the epithelium, but oftentimes do, no, do not penetrate the surface mucous cells. Often involves the antrum, but also can uh, spread to the fundic mucosa. Remember that this bacteria can induce some mucosal associated lymphoid tissue or malt if it progresses and it has the potential to lead to lymphoma. Not always will call us lymphoma, but it can um, lead to malt lymphoma. It can also induce um, intestinal metaplasia and cause adenocarcinoma. So this is how the histology of Helicobacter pylori looks like. So this is a normal uh, gastric mucosa. As you can see, there's not much inflammation. And as you can see here, there's expansion of, um, between the um, epithelium with lots of plasma cells and chronic inflammation. It is a top heavy inflammation as we call it in pathology. You see the inflammation is mostly to the first half half the first top of the epithelium expanding and uh, on going underneath actually the gastric foveolar epithelium. So this is a top heavy inflammation and 
This is another picture. This is involving the antrum. These are antral type glands. As you can see, they're mucinous glands. They're no longer fundic type glands. And you have lots of plasma cells and lymphocytes. It's top heavy inflammation. Sometimes you have mucosal associated lymphoid tissue or lymphoid aggregates. And these are the ones that can have the potential to lead to uh, you know, lymphoma. How do we see them? These are the bacteria. If you zoom in and uh, going to the high power, you can see the spiral shaped uh, bacteria attaching to the uh, mucous cells. And usually it does not penetrate and doesn't go to the tissue, it just attaches here. And if you would do immunohistochemical stain, it, they will turn brown. So all the brown is our bacteria and the blue is uh, our normal tissue. You can see how it's attaching to the gastric fulvular epithelium. Moving to autoimmune gastritis. Autoimmune, another name for it is autoimmune metaplastic atrophic gastritis, in short for AMAC. So oftentimes you have destruction of parietal cells and by the antibody against parietal cell or anti-parietal cell antibody in 90% of cases or antibody or an or and antibody against intrinsic factor. So basically you have destruction of parietal cells in the body and fundus. So when you, parietal cells, as you know, they secrete acid, right? So whenever you don't have them, you have hypochloridria or achloridria, uh, you have reduced serum pepsinogen because parietal cells uh, um, actually secrete pepsinogen. So you have a reduced serum pepsinogen concentration and you also have high serum gastrin levels. We'll go over this pathogenesis in the next slide and I'll tell you why the gastric level goes up. Basically, when you don't have acids, gastric level, gastric levels go up. Autoimmune gastritis is often associated with other autoimmune diseases, like it can, patients can have, uh, not always, but they can have Hashimoto thyroiditis, Addison disease, other autoimmune diseases. Whenever you have anti-intrinsic factor or you, or you have reduction of parietal cells, you don't have intrinsic factor basically produced, so you will have uh, low vitamin B12 and vitamin B12 deficiency basically when it's not going to be absorbed in the ileum. You have increased risk of dysplasia and carcinoma, and you have a very high risk of gastric neuroendocrine tumors. Let's go over this. So this is pathogenesis of autoimmune gastritis. This is the normal, uh, you know, gastric mucosa. The pink is your parietal cells, as you can see. ECL cells or neuroendocrine cells here are that produce um, histamine. You have some of them here, not many, and scattered in the fundic. These are G cells or gastrin producing cells that can stimulate uh, the acid production, basically. So whenever you have an autoimmune gastritis, you have antibody against uh, parietal cells, right? So you have loss of these pink parietal cells here. You see, they're destroyed here. And so there is no longer acid in inter interesting factor of production. You have a feedback to G cells. They will become hyperplasia and G cell hyperplasia in the antrum will cause gastrin production and gastrin secretion. These gastrin will work on the ECL or enterochromaffin cell like um, uh, cells in the fundus. These are the endocrine cells and these are not destroyed by the antibodies actually. So they become hyperplasia. They secrete histamine to stimulate the parietal cells that are no longer there. So you see the, how the feedback works? So you lose these parietal cells. You will have increase in the gastrin, which works in these endocrine cells or neuroendocrine cells that will produce uh, histamine. So whenever you have hyperplasia in neuroendocrine cells, you are at risk to get neuroendocrine tumors. Um, you have increased gastrin level in these patients in the serum. And also since you don't no longer have intrinsic factor, you can have low B12 and you have vitamin B12 deficiency. 
what is the histology? What do I see in the histology of autoimmune gastritis? This is basically a normal fundic mucosa. You see the pink parietal cells, your chief cells are here. So basically there's not much inflammation. Look at this one. This is a fundic mucosa. This is not an antral mucosa. And what do I see? There is fundic, where are the fundic glands? There's no fundic glands here. And where are the parietal cells? There's no parietal cells left. So basically loss of parietal cells. You have some mucin producing gland or pyloric gland metaplasia basically. And you have deep uh, lymphoplasmocytic inflammation. This inflammation is not only top heavy, it goes all the way to the muscularis mucosa. This is your muscularis mucosa layer. So this inflammation is basically bottom heavy or everywhere in the mucosa. This is basically showing a normal gastric mucosa. It's here on the left. And as you can see here, you have inflammation and you can see you have intestinal metaplasia. So not only you have inflammation, you have intestinal metaplasia here. So those are the, uh, why the patients are at risk for um, carcinomas. This is again, another histology of you know, autoimmune gastritis. These are normal gastric mucosa. As you can see, these are neuroendocrine hyperplasia. These are neuroendocrine cells. You can have hyperplasia, or if it goes on uh, for a while, you can have neuroendocrine tumor. They are very, they're 13 times um, higher uh, risk of getting neuroendocrine tumor in these patients. And if you are you have any uh, you know doubts that if they are these are neuroendocrine cells or not, we have a stain in a pathology that we can do. We can do chromogranin immunohistochemistry or immunostain, and this will light up. So this is a neuroendocrine tumor basically arising in a patient with autoimmune gastritis. So let's compare helicobacter pylori gastritis and autoimmune gastritis. As we um, spoke before, H. pylori or helicobacter pylori gastritis is more commonly seen in the antrum. Autoimmune gastritis more commonly seen in the body, correct? Because you have antiparietal cells and parietal cells are located in the body and funded. So acid production in a H. pylori oftentimes is a little bit in, uh, increased or it could be a little bit decreased. However, in autoimmune gastritis is very much decreased or you have hypochloridia or um, achloridia due to uh, basically loss of your parietal cells. Gastrin, it's normal to decrease in H. pylori, but it's very much increased because you have low acid, you have the feedback to increase gastrin, correct? So gastrin is very much increased in autoimmune gastritis. What kind of antibody you have in uh, both, both patients? You have antibody to H. pylori and helicobacter pylori gastritis. In autoimmune gastritis, you have antibody to parietal cells and intrinsic factor. What is the sequela of these diseases in H. pylori gastritis? It can lead to peptic ulcer. It can lead to adenocarcinoma, maltoma, or lymphoma, basically, that's arising from mucosal-associated lymphoid tissue maltoma. In autoimmune gastritis, oftentimes you have atrophy, you have pernicious anemia, due to a vitamin B12 deficiency. You can also have adenocarcinoma. We said you can have intestinal metaplasia and dysplasia and leading to adenocarcinoma. You have neuroendocrine tumor. These are uh, the sequela of autoimmune gastritis. Association, H. pylori gastritis, oftentimes it's associated with low socioeconomic status, poverty, residual in rural areas. Autoimmune gastritis, it's basically associated with other autoimmune diseases, thyroiditis, diabetes, and Graves' disease. What is the complication of chronic gastritis? If chronic gastritis is going, um, is present for a while and it's not treated, it can lead to ulcer, basically peptic ulcer disease. It's uh, whenever you have imbalance between something that's damaging, damaging factors, and you don't have your mucosal defense mechanism. When there's an imbalance between these two, you have an ulcer. Peptic ulcer disease can be an ulcer in the duodenum or gastric ulcer. Both of them are termed peptic ulcer disease. Nearly all antral gastric peptic ulcer disease is caused by H. pylori, helicobacter pylori, or NSAID medication, or smoking, or other agents. 
uh, what are the other complication of chronic gastritis? You can have some tumors. You can get adenocarcinomas, dysplasias. You can have gastric lymphomas or mult lymphomas, and you can have neuroendocrine tumors. This is the histologic view of an ulcer. So this is a gastric specimen. There is a deep ulcer, and this one had the area of perforation, actually. You can see the normal folds on the left and on the right, and you have a deep ulcer here. This is another one. This is a normal stomach on the left side, and this is an area of ulceration. Histologically, you can see normal stomach mucosa and a deep ulcer. This is loss of the entire um, mucosal and entire architecture, lots of inflammatory exudates and a reaction and some, you know, dilated blood vessels that reacting to the, this area of huge ulceration. So summary of part three, which is chronic gastritis. The most common cause of chronic gastritis is helicobacter pylori infection. Autoimmune gastritis is the most frequent etiology when there's no infection of a non-infectious chronic gastritis. It results in atrophic, um, at atrophy of atrophy of a gastric body. It can lead to decreased acid production. It can have antral G cell hyperplasia and vitamin B12 deficiency. Intestinal metaplasia can develop in both forms of chronic gastritis. It's a risk factor for gastric adenocarcinoma. We said that autoimmune gastritis can lead to neuroendocrine tumors, remember that. Peptic ulcer disease is usually secondary to H. pylori chronic gastritis or NSAIDs. Ulcers can develop in the stomach or a duodenum. This is another picture of beautiful, uh, you know, Chicago. Feel free to email me and this is my Twitter handle. Keep in touch. Thank you.